Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Viafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. Welcome to the Pool Chasers Podcast. This is episode 11. So you've heard us talk a lot about Jobber for the last 10 episodes now. There's a real good reason for that. One, they're our sponsor. And two, their software kicks ass. On this episode, we talk with Jobber CEO Sam Piller. After our conversation with him, it was very clear why their product works so well. This episode is full of information that can help any leader. We hope you all enjoy. Hey, guys. Hey, hey what's going on, Sam? <laughs> Not much. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. good. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sam. We know you're a busy guy. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Absolutely. No, I mean, thanks Thanks for having me. It's, uh, um, you know, jumped at the opportunity. Molly, Molly mentioned it, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, yes, you know what? I've I've seen. I was I was checking out uh, some of the the material, and I mean, you know, like uh, I'm I've been hearing about uh, you guys and and um, sort of you know the Brothers Pool Service, but also um, the uh, the podcast uh, for for the last few months. I know we've been working with you guys for a while, so I actually have checked out the podcast and uh, um, have seen a bunch of the Instagram stuff. Um, and, and you know, I, I I think as well, there's there's probably a lot of alignment, um, just sort of culturally and and philosophically. Um, in, in how we think about business building, um, just from the, the few podcasts I've, I've listened to and, and some of the conversations you've had with, with guests, I can, I can tell you guys, you, you think really seriously about, about the customer and the value you're delivering and, and, and what you're doing and, and how you're doing it, um, which is a big part about how we, we think about building Jobber and, and not just the business of Jobber, but the organization, our product and, and uh, the responsibility that we have to our customers in the, in the market. So I'm not, I'm not surprised that we get along. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Sure. So you want to introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, what your role is at Jobber exactly? Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Sam Piller. Uh, I am one of the one of two co-founders of Jobber and uh, and the CEO uh, of the company. Um, <clears throat> we we started the company. We launched Jobber in back in 2011. So it's been um, it seems like at the same time you know a very long time, but also a, a hardly very long at all. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've grown the company in that time from, from just my co-founder Forrest and I, um, to 110 people, um, headquartered here in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is where I am today. Uh, we have a growing office in, in Toronto, Ontario, uh, Canada as well. Um, we service customers all over the world. Um, obviously North America is our, our you know, prime market, but, um, we've got customers in over 45 countries. Wow, that's very impressive, and we've seen some photos online of the inside of the Jobber headquarters, and it's phenomenal. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we're we're really proud of it. We've been in this uh, office for uh, a little over three years now, and uh, yeah, we we moved in here um, with uh, I think twenty five people, twenty twenty three, twenty five people, something uh, on that order, and um, yeah, I've grown. We've got you know about 95 100 people or so in this in this space so it's starting to get a little, little bit tight but um we've we've really we've really made it our own it's going to be uh sad when we when we ultimately have to have to find new new digs so you have like two or three floors there right full of people and you was at like nine thousand plus square feet or something yeah we've got three we've got three floors when we first moved in we had two um with the option to expand mm-hmm. to to three so um about a year after moving in um, we sort of took the took the the third floor, uh, built it out. Um, it's a beautiful old historic building uh, here in, in Edmonton. Edmonton's only um, a little over 100 years old as a city. The um, uh, the building was built in 1908, I believe. It's called uh, Jasper Block, um, and uh, yeah, and we have the whole thing. There's a restaurant on the main floor, but um, all of the above uh, ground uh, floors we we have, and uh, it's just shy of about 15,000 square feet. Awesome. So before we get started, um, do you have any stories or memories that were made by the pool that you'd like to share with us? I have a I have a swimming pool story. Um, we had yeah when I was uh, born until the time I was five years old, I think, and and we moved five or six years old. I think we moved when I was six. Um, my, my family had a, a, a swimming pool in the backyard and I don't know if you can see this, but <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> when I was about four or five years old, you know, brave, full of piss and vinegar, water wings on, <laughs> uh, 
stood at the uh, the side of the pool and I was I was developing my repertoire of, of tricks. And uh, one of them was to just jump off the edge and spin around, do a 360 into the pool. And uh, I didn't make it. I spun around and I came down and slammed my chin on the side of the pool and uh, knocked myself out. Um, you know, my parents were, this is, you know, 1986 or whatever. So there's no like, you know, surveillance monitoring the pool. <laughs> like my parents are in the backyard, but I've got water wings on, you know, he's good. And, uh, knocked myself out and I'm floating in the middle of the pool in a, a cloud of, uh, of, of blood. And, uh, yeah, my, my, my dad saw me from further up in the yard and sprinted down and, and, uh, saved my life, I guess. So thanks dad. <laughs> wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that I don't I don't remember it. I just you know have heard stories about it all all my life, uh, and then um, I don't have I don't have easy access to a to a to a swimming pool these days. But I do um, you know really respect uh, or or sort of you know recently have a, a respect for the quality of a pool. Uh, I, I last year um, was sort of doing the the house hunt. I, I bought a condo. Um, in uh, in Edmonton, and I looked at a bunch of places uh, that have pools in them. Uh, condo pools are probably a bit different than backyard pools, but uh, it seems to be a big issue in, in condos. The the sort of quality of the pools and um, just the problems that 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 exist uh, and the impact that that has on owners and condo fees and stuff like that, which is. I mean, obviously, a, a, a direct analogy to the, the problems that a homeowner would have if, like, you know, somebody just isn't putting the the thought and attention to detail into into building something as like major as that. Because if something goes wrong, like, it's not like, oh, we'll just place a part. You're building a pool. You know, it's a it's a big deal. <laughs> Very big deal. I've seen a lot of issues where they build them in the condos or high rise hotels and things like that. And if they have a lot of wind, they start to sway. And there was a video where the water, the, the wind was so crazy, the water kind of bounced out and took out the hotel windows where it was just bouncing out and then it's just smashing on the window. <laughs> and it's like, oh. I'm thinking no. to myself, I'm like, what the hell do you do at this point? Drain it and turn it into a, a new condo or what do you, or a hotel room or whatever you do. Yeah, garden maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seeing that. Nice. nice. So um, we'll jump right into this. You want to tell us a little bit about your background growing up in Canada and just kind of what led up to uh, starting Jobber? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I've kind of bounced around uh, a little bit across the, the country. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I grew up, um, sort of spent my formative years in, uh, in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, um, <clears throat> was a, a for lack of a better word, a computer nerd uh, all my life. I was I was just really uh, interested in in computers and technology. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think uh, I I sort of grew up um, at a really interesting time in, and I mean, I think everybody says this in in retrospect and with the benefit of hindsight. But um, in in terms of the technology uh, timeline and and you know how the internet sort of came to be and and sort of broadband internet. Um, you know, came came on the scene. Like I, I just I remember all of that. Like I remember um, BBSs, and I remember you know using you know a fourteen point four BPS like dial up modem to get access to the very early internet and GeoCities, and um, you know it was just a, 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 a different time, like unrecognizable compared to the technology environment today. Um, and you know, if you are sort of a, a young person. Um, you know, using mobile devices and, and sort of the modern internet and, and services that are that are available, um, it's just kind of unrecognizable. So that that shift um, was something that that I feel like I was very much a part of, um, <clears throat> and uh, and so yeah, I, I got really interested in. It. I taught myself to program uh, or started sort of learning to program, learning about programming um, quite early. I was um, you know eleven or twelve years old and, and sort of developed an interest um, and. Uh, yeah, so it's sort of sort of bounced around. I moved um, over to Ontario for a period of time. Lived in, in Toronto for for a year. Lived in Regina, Saskatchewan for um, a few years. And in 2001, I moved to Edmonton, uh, Alberta, um, for university. And uh, I took computer science um, here in university. And by by that time, had had spent you know many years sort of really kind of developing. Uh, my interest in in computers and and networking and just hardware and 
um, and, and programming specifically, but, but, but technology more generally um, was just a, a, a real solid interest. So I, I was in computer science for a few years um, here at, at the University of Alberta, um, ended up developing um, an interest in intellectual property law um, and uh, decided that I wanted to go to law school. So my, my quickest path to that was, um, was, was through the business school here um, and, and with a, a business law uh, sort of specialization, which was sort of a fast track to, uh, to law. But problem was you're, when you're a, a young, idealistic uh, university student, um, you know, you think the real world is, is something that it oftentimes turns out not to be. Um, and that's actually really good. I think it's a, uh, it's a good thing for, for young people to be idealistic and, and um, you know, believe that they can change the world because you, you can. Um, but uh, oftentimes it's in ways that you didn't uh, uh, necessarily think when you were in university. So for me, um, <clears throat> I, I was really interested in intellectual property law from um, from an activist perspective, I thought that copyright and, um, and and patent in particular were broken systems that stifled creativity and innovation and were really kind of holding us back as a uh, as a civilization. And um, and uh, and that uh, um, was the impetus for my interest in, in going to law school, which <clears throat> which I ended up not doing. I did a lot of um, research and spoke to um, a bunch of, of lawyers um, you know, pr practicing lawyers, you know, articling students, senior partners, retired lawyers. I, I talked to, you know, five or six um, sort of different varieties of <clears throat> people along the journey and not a single one recommended uh, <laughs> going down that path. They were all, um, you know, really sort of stressed and, and, uh, and you know, s cynical in some cases as well. Um, and, and I realized through that process that, um, that going down that path would, would mean that I wouldn't actually be um, able to pursue my, my activist interest in intellectual property law. I would actually have to be on the other side of the table doing exactly the thing that I, that I thought was, was broken about it. So, so anyway, I, 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 um, I didn't go down that path. I graduated um, and uh, um, worked as a management consultant for um, a big IT consulting firm for a couple of years. And... Uh, that was uh, that was a really interesting experience. I worked on on <clears throat> excuse me all kinds of, of you know really cool projects, um, but they were all really big um, sort of nefarious projects. You know, like big big sort of you know things for for government in particular, um, where you're you're contributing a really interesting sort of you know little uh, piece of, of of what ultimately is going to be a, a a big machine someday, uh, but it's hard to really see how what you're working on connects to the thing that connects to the thing that connects to the thing that ultimately is going to make a difference in people's lives. And um, <clears throat> and I just became frustrated with that. <clears throat> I think anybody who's worked at a consulting firm, especially one that does work for government, um, sort of resonates with the, the reality that a lot of what you work on um, goes into a binder and onto a shelf somewhere and, and just, um, <laughs> times never gets, never gets looked at again. So, um, until it so, needs yeah. to be updated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that was, uh, that I, I sort of left that, um, world and was to, to be perfectly honest, wasn't quite sure what I was, um, going to do. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, so I, I just spent some time, um, hanging out really. I did a bunch of reading. Um, <clears throat> I worked at as a, I worked at a bar for a little while, and uh, and also as a bike courier um, here in in Edmonton, which uh, which I started in a February, and I don't know how much you know about Edmonton, but <laughs> very you know it's 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 not unusual for it to get to 30, 35 below zero uh, Celsius in the winter. Um, so so that was a really interesting experience and a, and a really fun job. But um, after a little while, I started to really miss uh, technology and programming and. Um, so I started to, to poke around what was new and, and sort of in the time that I'd uh, sort of from I'd, from the time that I'd switched into into business and university to to sort of, you know, a couple years after graduation, a lot had happened. Um, you know, Facebook had, had really started to, to sort of come on the scene, pick up steam. Twitter had been um, released. Um, this this idea of social media that seems um, just so like intuitive and instinctive today. Everybody, everybody knows the term. People know exactly what you mean when you say social media. Um, even though there are new platforms sort of you know coming around the periphery all the time, um, it's a it's a well known sort of 
thing that everybody has a mental model of. Um, back then, it, that wasn't really the case. Like nobody really knew what social media was. So, yeah. so it was uh, uh, like a lot had happened, and and um, and a lot had happened in sort of the world of um, of, of technology development, and and uh, and in particular, um, rapid software development. So, um, Twitter actually. At the time, um, it, it was built on something called Ruby on Rails, which is um, a programming language and web development slash um, object relational model framework that allows you to um, pretty quickly uh, build software that that you know like actually does stuff. As compared to a you know a handful of years prior, where um, you know software development was a, a much more or at least to build like a practical product that you could really get out there for people to use um, was just a, a, a much you know bigger hairier problem to, to tackle so so I started spending sort of a lot of time evenings and weekends and um, just just like brushing up on on what was happening I so I, I started learning Ruby on Rails a um, couple of other um, sort of you know programming languages that were uh, gaining momentum in the web sort of development um, arena, and um, and it just it was super fun. I just really really uh, liked it and and sort of uh, was re-energized. Just missed it. It's, it had been a few years since I'd really been deep into uh, into anything sort of you know computer focused and especially around programming. And um, so over the course of you know about a year, um, <clears throat> I sort of brushed up. Um, you know, got sort of, you know, re, uh, retooled up, uh, I guess, uh, sort of sharpened my, my skills a little bit and, uh, and started picking up a couple of, uh, little projects. So at first I did a couple of, you know, quick little, um, you know, contracts for, for people that I knew, um, and it gradually turned into a, uh, sort of a freelance, um, practice. And so I, I sort of, was bartending less and less. I dropped the bike couriering thing, um, and I started actually making a, a little bit of money um, doing the uh, the software development stuff. And and um, and then over over time, it turned into my my full time uh, gig. And I, I sort of worked on a worked on a handful of of really neat projects for not for profit organizations uh, that had a little bit of budget um, and some small businesses. Um, and that was sort of the period um, where I really sort of developed. A, um, an immense respect for and affinity for a small business. And um, I think over the over the course of the last like like well, ten years now, I guess, uh, which is crazy to, to think about, um, have just sort of further developed my my thoughts around um, you know small business and and just the the importance of the importance of small business in in the economy overall. Uh, but like I say, my my affinity for um, small business people and and sort of how hard they they grind uh, in order to do what they're what they're doing um, and then also have built a business that very much is um, you know centered around this this idea that that small business people are um, are a, a really important sort of group to for us to try and help support so um, <clears throat> yeah we so, saw that you um, did some like home home service company consulting or something right did you is that kind of what led you to realize maybe what was missing in those areas? Yeah. I mean, I think all of the experiences that I, that I had during that freelance period were kind of formative to creating this, like this idea of, of, you know, what, what the small business world looked like. Um, even the sort of, you know, not for profits are still um, in a lot of senses, like small businesses, you know, like they're, it's just a group of, of people, um, who all sort of, you know, share various responsibilities. They wear lots of different hats um, and, you know, they're just struggling to do a, to do a good thing. And, and, um, and at the time, um, you know, this is sort of 2008, 2009, um, the technology world was very different than what it is today. Like the, the way that I like to, to, to try and sort of contextualize and frame it is try to think back and remember what your phone looked like in 2008, 2009. Like what was your, <laughs> what was your phone that you were using on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, and that's like a really great way to kind of rewind without having to go back and look at pictures of yourself from 10 years ago um, to really sort of like frame what, what the environment was. Um, from a technology enablement perspective, if you were a small business, if you were a not-for-profit and you were out there 
uh, on the internet searching for for tools to help you do your your, your day to day work or your or, or even sort of like the broader month to month stuff. Um, it was this is a very different thing. Like I know you, you know you guys use a, a, a bunch of different tools um, to to help run your your, your business and <clears throat> Jobber is just one of them. I know there's some you know visualization tools and um, sort of like graphic tools that you, you use to help map and model the projects that you work on. That kind of stuff just like didn't exist for you 10 years ago, you know, like if yeah. you wanted yeah. to use that kind of stuff, it was insanely expensive, impossible to use. You'd have to you'd do all kinds of training to, to figure out how to use it. Um, so the, so the opportunities to, um, to, to use some of this sort of new rapid software development, um, tooling to, to, that, that was sort of like coming up and it wasn't perfect, right? It was, it was in development and, and pretty new and Twitter actually famously moved off of Ruby on Rails at one point because it wasn't scaling um, with the business. It wasn't able to handle how fast Twitter was growing. Um, I, th I think Ruby on Rails now like can handle that kind of thing, but at the time it was still very developmental and it was you know early versions of, of Rails. Um, so, but that was intersecting with, with sort of a, a perfect moment in time where there was no, uh, or not no, but very little software available for the kinds of small businesses and not-for-profits that I was getting exposure to. And I just saw that as a, as a really amazing opportunity to, to, to jump in and, and try to do something. And yeah, then we I've have heard you talk about kind of, you know, how, and I think the pool industry in particular has a lot of people still using paper and pencils and log records, tracking that through paper and pen. Is that Part, you just kind of see that in some of those home-based businesses and you could see how to improve that and make it better using the technology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, in 2011 when we launched the first version, I mean, there aren't versions of Jobber and we can talk about that a little bit as well in the context of SaaS software versus something you would download or get on a CD and install. Um, there's no versions. It's like Every week we're pushing new new features. Every day, um, you know, we're fixing issues or making tweaks to make the the product better. Um, but when we launched first in 2011, um, people were, I mean, businesses were just all pen and paper. It was just all, you know, I've got a coil bound notebook and it's stuffed all around the edges with post-it notes. And if I lose that thing, like I'm screwed. You know, like yep. you're you, you just are de a dead. Like everything is in there all the contact information for your customers, all of the jobs, um, you know, that you've got scheduled for the next three weeks or month, um, you know, the, the handful of people that, that owe you money um, from the past, you know, 60, 90 days, like for work you've done that you should be getting paid for. Um, and today, um, it's very much the same. It's, it's you know, there, there's been, um, you know, a pretty reasonable amount of technology adoption, but um, small businesses and in particular small home service businesses um, are pretty far behind the technology adoption curve um, relative to, you know, sort of how they use consumer technology even. So there's still a lot of, of pen and paper in these in these businesses um, or a hodgepodge of sort of single feature systems. So um, you might you might do use a lot of pen and paper, but you might also have, you know, a Google Calendar set up. And your bookkeeper helps you use um, QuickBooks Online or something like that um, to, to to manage the books and maybe do some invoicing that you have you know very little oversight over because it's in your your bookkeeper's environment and and it's not really connected to your scheduling system or your CRM which is probably a, a notebook so um, so that's where we're we're getting to that place I think now where a lot of businesses are are using sort of a collection of. Uh, of different sort of single like like point solution software, um, but uh, but the full front to back like business enabling coordination amongst those tools. And that's that's what we aim to solve. Like we just we just want our customers to be as successful as they possibly can be, and 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 Jobber is really um, about that. It's about trying to tie together all of the most like necessary points of coordination so that you can do what you're good at. Um, and and uh, and not have to worry about connecting a, a schedule to an invoicing uh, uh, process. Right. Crazy thing about a year ago, we were at a uh, pool trade show, and a gentleman actually teaching the class to new pool service and repair <laughs> business owners was actually 
telling them the best way to organize your customers and keep their information is to go to Staples or any kind of office store and uh, pretty much just get file folders with all customers' names on it. And just, you know, when you get a new customer, you write down all their information and you just stick it in their folder and you just keep it in your vehicle at all times. That way, you know, when you get there and there's any kind of changes, you pull the file out, this and that. And I just looked around and I saw tons of people our age, which is crazy and younger, and they're yeah. taking notes on this. And I actually nudged the, the kid next to me. I said, hey, I'm like, don't, don't listen to this. <laughs> I mean, I'm not one to be like that, but he was, he was not correct. He's very that, is not about the, it too. that is not the way that you do things. Um, and he actually spoke about, a little bit about technology, and I think he did not fully understand technology um, because I'll put my money on technology all day. I live in a very... Um, nice neighborhood where things don't really ever happen, very little break-ins and things like that. And probably about six months ago, both my windows got knocked out and everything got stolen out. All my tools, they stole my gym bag. They stole things that didn't, I don't even know why you'd steal them. You know what I mean? Like a pack of gum or something. Yeah. If my, all my clients were in there, um, yeah. I'd probably be out of business because yeah. I wouldn't know how to get there. I wouldn't know anything. I yeah. mean, literally you know, keeping a file of the, the contact names, the home addresses, um, all of that stuff. Like what is your car could burn up. Anything can happen. Um, and that's just, it, it's crazy that, um, people think that's the way to go. Cause this day and age it's, it's really not. And I think it's really inconvenient for the end user as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a whole other, other topic, sort of like the, the importance of the relationship between you and your customer and trying to make that just as easy and as an impressive for your customer as possible. But, but to the, to your point, I mean, you know, yeah, like your, your truck is replaceable. All the tools in your truck are replaceable. Your pack of gum is replaceable. Um, your, your complete sort of front to back record of your relationship with your, with your customers um, both past, present, and sort of future commitments is irreplaceable. Like you yeah. can't, you can't replace that. Like it's if that if the only record of that is in your truck and your truck burns up or gets stolen, like yeah, even it's if it's bad. in your house, I mean, and it gets broken into your stolen. Yeah. So yeah. not only in your truck, but um, you kind of mentioned CRM. Um, I think we've adapted that at Brothers as Jobber being sort of a CRM. Do you guys kind of view it as a CRM type or how do you yeah, approach it? Absolutely. That? I mean, I, I think that, so CRM is, is one of those, um, one of those buzzwords that's, and I mean, you know, one of the biggest SaaS businesses in the world, most successful, um, you know, like first to market with, with sort of, you know, SaaS, a SaaS product, um, or, or at least first to really kind of popularize, um, you know, marketing this, this distinction of, 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 you know, SaaS versus like installable software. They used to have this, this great marketing campaign with, um, it just so it says software and there was like a circle with a line through it, like kill all software is Salesforce. Um, Salesforce mm -hmm. is, a, is a CRM. We use Salesforce uh, at, at Jobber to, to sort of enable and, and uh, power part of our, our sales process and our sales team. Um, but, you know, I think CRM gets, um, conflated sometimes uh, in in sort of use cases where really complex CRM capabilities aren't really necessary. Like for a for a home service business to use something like Salesforce would just be crazy overkill. Over the top. Yeah. So you know, I think that you know, Jobber is not a competitor to Salesforce um, or PipeDrive or Sugar CRM or any of the other sort of big CRM players. Um, but we absolutely are a, a CRM or like a part of, um, of our, our capability and our feature set is CRM for small home service businesses. So it's, you know, all of the basic, cause all of the CRM is customer, customer relationship management. So mm -hmm. keeping track of all of your, your, your customer information, um, their, you know, phone numbers, addresses, notes, photos, attachments, and then anything else that, that hangs off of that customer record. And for us, we build that specifically for home service businesses. So all of the work requests and quotes, all of the jobs, a complete history of every visit that anybody that works for your company has ever done to that customer, invoices, payments, 
like a complete sort of historical record of your relationship with that customer tied to that customer record. That's yeah. CRM in the context of, of the service that we provide. Um, yeah, I mean, so, it yeah. tracks, it tracks, I mean, things that you can't even track on paper, right? Like that's, you're talking about how it will track every visit that everybody on your team has been. So in, in our industry specifically, if you have a larger company like we do with multiple, you know, people out in the field at the same time, you only, ha if you have a logbook, you only have one logbook for that customer, right? So you can't like put the notes in like, Hey, I stopped by here to check on an autofill or something and say, Hey, you know, this, this record was recorded, but with jobber, how we use it as that CRM, anybody that can go in there can check into that house or, you know, go on that log record, Mark, you know, start timer and kind of go in and show what they did. And that actually relates to our whole entire office through, you know, our receptionist into, you know, our hands if we need be, yeah. or we need to address like an issue with the customer and said, Hey, you guys didn't come out. Well, we can now view the record and say, yes, we did come out, you know, as, as opposed to going to our employee and saying, Hey, can you give me the record for Mr. Johnson's house? And let me see what you did. Oh, you didn't write it down. So now we have no proof that we went there you know, those type of things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, GPS tracking as well. Like if you're using time tracking or marking jobs complete, you can show that, that like there's a GPS waypoint at this location at this time on this day. Like we were there. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've got examples, case studies internally of, of customers who have um, used that in the past to, to successfully dispute um, or, or to successfully sort of mitigate disputes that, that customers have uh have, have tried to make. I mean, people can be, can be sneaky. So yeah, they can be. I mean, they, but also they don't know if they're not home, they don't see you. I mean, there's no proof. I mean, you don't leave a tag or something, you know, like people used to leave tags, but if your guy forgets to leave a tag or something, then I mean, there's no, and that's understandable as a consumer. If I had that, I mean, sure. I, I have no proof that you're at my house. You know, I was at home, I was working in the day. So that's one of our favorite parts about jobber, you know, using that is just, being able to see that track record, law record, and being able to prove those things, and not they're not necessarily you know people trying to get free stuff. It's just consumers seeing like, hey, you know, it's I, accountability. I pay, yeah, accountability for sure. I I pay for something, you know, I I don't see that you guys are delivering that, and we can show that we delivered that, and that's that's pretty awesome. And the cool thing is, it's not just one big list of things that we've done at that customer's house over time. Really like that we do uh, multiple jobs at one person's house. Um, but each job has its uh, before photos, um, after photos. If a project didn't get complete, there's things that need to be done. This is the reason why we didn't get done. And we actually get to look at those at the end of each day. And it's not looking at every little thing we did. We could look at a specific job that we did um, with all its photos and the notes. Our repair guy, he takes before and after photos of everything. And he does a very long write-up of everything that happened. He discussed um, programming to the customer. Um, we need to send them, you know, rebate forms, all that stuff. It's all really transparent and it gets communicated back to the office so yeah. that we can do our job in getting that information to the customer. Um, I think one of the coolest things about Jobber is there's so many things that you can do with it, but you can kind of make it your own. So there are features that we don't use, but I think we also use it. Um, I think we use it in a way that maybe other people don't use it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we use it to do initial bids and things like that. Um, and we use it to really communicate with our customers in a really professional manner. It's really cool that you can send them even an email that, hey, just a reminder, we're going to be there, uh, you know, today between 11 and 1 p.m. This is the address. Um, would you like to confirm your appointment? Yes. And that gets communicated back to us. And that really just takes a huge hassle out of everything. It takes a hassle from us, um, from them and calling them, leaving a voicemail. They got to call us back because, hey, we're not the only ones busy. So are they. You yeah. know what I mean? So and most it's, importantly, uh, it, it saves us time, right? I oh, mean, yeah. Tons time is our most valuable asset, especially now. And that's the most important part to us. Yeah. yeah. That's that's a really gr like good and important point, I think, that, that time is the most valuable resource. I think... I think a lot of small business people undervalue their time. They think it's free. And, and so when we, you know, we have this conversation all the time with customers where, um, you know, or, or in the sales process, I should say, with potential customers where, um, you know, the, like it's pretty easy to, to back into an ROI 
um, very quickly with something like Jobber that makes sense, right? Like how, how much is your time worth and how many hours a month is this gonna save you? Okay, well, you know, it's gonna save you you know, probably 10 times as much as it would need to, to pay for itself um, or more, depending on what kind of business, what the use case is. But a lot of people, they think their time is free. They just don't value it, right? Like you should be valuing your time as your, especially as the business owner, um, as the most valuable resource, the most valuable asset in the company. Because the only way that you're gonna, that you're gonna continue to grow as a company and that you're gonna be able to continue to, you know, create an environment for, for growth is to make time to, to sharpen the ax, right? Like if you, 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 need, to, you need to figure out um, and, and spend enough of your, of, your, of your time trying to build systems, build processes, um, and solve more fundamental problems that allow you to do more with less, rather than just like thrashing about doing as, as much as you can aim, aimlessly, you know, like you really need to um, spend that, that creative time building the business. I mean, it's the classic, like working on the business versus in the business mm -hmm. uh, question. And, and I think a lot of people just don't, don't value their time um, appropriately in that, in that regard. I think people don't like what they don't understand because if they think that this software would save them time, they don't really understand it. And they don't think that them taking the time to understand how to use it, they feel like they're wasting time. But if they actually just took the time to figure it out and use it, it would save them a ton of time. And that's really where we're at right now is, you know, we want things to be done more efficiently. So we're always creating better processes because we're like, okay, this is an issue. We know how this should go, but we're not being transparent enough with our team or the customer. So we need to take time to build this process so that it's, you know, it's in stone. This is the way that we do it. And everybody's on the same page. And that way there's not that, that waste of time. Cause I see so many people do it all the time where they're just wasting time. It's like, dude, you've been doing this for how long? Like you haven't sat down and put this on paper. You know what I mean? You're explaining the same thing over and over again. Like just take the time to understand it. And that was with Jobber. I mean, I think we had Jobber for about I don't know, maybe like six months to a year where we had it, but we didn't take the time to really um, fully understand it because we jump into it. And we're like, oh man, I don't, I don't really know. You know what I mean? But then we're like, dude, like screw this. We're just going to like, we're going to slow the business down a little bit and we're going to take the time to really dive into this, call them if need be. And we did, we were on the Jobber Academy. We called you guys a ton and you guys' customer service team is just out of this world's best customer service we've dealt with uh, probably ever. Mm -hmm. um, but you. they really coached us through everything. And we're like, dude, like, this is awesome. Like, the interface is beautiful. The customers love it. Um, and it was just a really good experience. And, you know, to this day, it saved us, saves us an insane amount of time. Because what we were doing before, I mean, we've used a lot of other things. I won't use some of the other software companies, but they were good for where we at, where we were at at that time. But definitely Jobber is uh, definitely has a lot more tools in the bag. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so we want to jump away from, um, you know, the Jobber into, commercial. Yeah. The Jobber <laughs> commercial right now. <laughs> um, so you have a business partner and this is kind of a, a big question because me and my brother Tyler here, we're, business partners with brothers and, um, what we do here at pool chasers and things like that. Love to hear, um, your take on having a business partner because a lot of people want to do it, but I don't know if they always know the pros and cons and really how to, you know, choose a good partner. So you want to talk to us about your relationship with your business partner? Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting topic. Um, you know, I think, I think probably I need to predicate my sort of opinions on this with the fact that, you know, we are, we're a venture backed, um, technology company, which I think, you know, I think there's a lot of, of similarities probably with, res with respect to sort of like a starting a business, um, and getting a partner. Um, but there are also a lot of differences with a, a venture backed sort of business. Like, so we, we've, we've raised venture capital, um, in order to build the business to the tune of, of millions of dollars. This is on public uh, record, but we've, we've raised about nine and a half million dollars um, over the course of the, the last you know, five or six years um, to build the business. And so we have um, really experienced investors um, you know, involved in, in the business help, helping us. I know sort of you know, one of the, the questions as well is about mentorship. Um, I think we were 
really fortunate to get um, early on, really strong early stage investors who have, you know, they, they serve that that sort of, you know, investor function. And there's a lot of pressure that comes from that. Uh, but they also serve that that sort of super important mentorship function as well. Um, so I think it's, I just want to sort of point that out because I think it does sort of create a bit of it or can create a bit of a different environment. Um, I would say though, regardless of, of what kind of business you're starting, um, having a partner is, is, is really important. Like I, I do not believe that uh, that that we, Jobber would be where it is today um, if Forrest, my my co-founder, um, was was not involved from from the, the beginning. Um, and and conversely, I don't think Jobber would be here today if if I wasn't involved and it was just just Forrest. Like it's hard doing what we do, doing what you guys do. I mean, you guys know it's it's a grind. It is super hard. Um, and I think over the years we've really sort of recognized that there are, and you you hear about this all the time or read about this all the time on the like you know, startup blogs and stuff like that. But the ups and downs are dramatic, right? Like when you're up, you are up, like you're on top of the world, everything is going great. And then something happens and and you're just sort of like bottom of the barrel, just really in the dumps. And what I've found is that for, for Forrest and I, our, our, our sort of mental state tends to, tends to sort of oscillate out of phase. So when I'm on my way up, like maybe he's on his way down and vice versa. And as a result, you can kind of keep focused and keep an even keel on average and, and just stay focused on putting, you know, the, the, the foot that might be dragging a little bit in front of the other and just keep moving forward. Because so often that's all you need to do is just keep moving forward. People give up. Um, I think why small business people are so amazing to me and the, the like a big part of um, the respect that I've developed for, for, for people who do what you guys do is just the tenacity. And, you know, tenacity is something that gets talked about a lot in the startup world. Um, and, and so just, just not giving up, just, just being really um, sort of unrelenting in putting one foot in front of the other and just keeping moving forward no matter what. Um, and that's, that is like a, that's a character trait um, that I think is overrepresented in small business people. Um, that's just awesome. It's really cool. Um, I have a lot of respect for it. And um, I think it's really important to have, by having a partner, uh, I think makes it easier to, to, to do that or makes it um, sort of less likely anyways, that you're going to, that you're going to hit the wall or run into that, that thing that finally prevents you from picking that dragging foot up and putting in front of the other one. Um, and, yeah. and I, I think that's, I think that's, that's important. It's been, it's been, um, awesome for me. Like our, my relationship with Forrest is, um, is very, very good. Uh, we don't, we didn't know each other from before starting the company. We, uh, we met in, uh, coffee shops, actually, he was a freelance software developer as well. And we just kept running into each other. And it was obvious that we were both freelance software developers using coffee shops as our sort of remote office and uh, and we're very sort of different people, um, and and we're so we're not like you know these sort of like outside of work super close friends, but we are are very close. I mean, I do consider him a close friend now. We've been doing this for for seven years, but but it's a different kind of relationship than you would have with like your childhood friend um, who you, you end up going into business with. And I mean, I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts on it because you're brothers and, and uh, uh, going into business with each other is a, is a, is a very different kind of thing than, than, than my backstory. And I've seen, that, I've seen that work a lot, sort of like childhood friends, best friends um, going into business. And I've also seen it really kind of explode. But Yeah, curious. I think we've been on record, I mean, in saying that we think it's very difficult Um you know, because you have a lot of history together, um, you have a lot of that background story. I think what we've talked about before, we don't have to get like super into it because it's been on a, a couple podcasts already, but um, you can hear us on episode one. We talk about it. I think one or two episodes ago, we talked about it quite a bit, um, but just a little bit of that story. I mean, being super communicative with one another is very, very important, as I'm sure it is for you guys. I think it's very difficult to 
to have that like partnership. You're saying to acquire a partner? Yeah, to acquire a partner, you know, and, and especially if you started it by yourself, maybe, um, you know, so I kind of wanted to touch base, but I think what you're saying and having the ideas to bounce off, you know, that, that could very well be in the, in the pool industry, you know, your wife is your partner, um, because, you know, one guy is running a business and the wife's doing the books or vice versa. I've heard that, um, you know, you can look into like business coaches, like we talked about with on episode four, I believe with Michael. Um, and then there's also, you know, mentors. That's why we, that's why we push mentorship so much. Cause I think in a way that becomes a partner, um, just for what you were talking about, how to bounce those ideas back and forth, how to keep you up when you're down, um, those type of things. So if you don't have a partnership in the beginning, um, I think, you know, that's a good thing to look for to be your sort of partner in a way. Um, that way you just have somebody else to bounce ideas. I think that's the most important part. The thing that we like the most is that when you have an idea or you have, um, you're, yeah, you're up or down or you just are dealing with a customer that's really difficult, you have somebody else to bounce that off of. And that makes it so much easier. And you know, the weight on your shoulders is much less because you just have a different opinion, different way out of that. So I don't know. What do you want to touch base on it? Maybe a little bit. But. Yeah, I think it's uh, we interviewed a company here, a very successful company here called Bobe Water Fire Features. And uh, their partnership kind of worked out the same as ours is that they grew up together so they really knew the knew each other extremely well and I think that's really important. I think it's really difficult to take on a partner that you don't know so well because I think people are always going to be a little bit different in the beginning where they where they like your idea and they might be good at say the the developing side or the marketing side and then you get, you know, quarter way through it and they just start fizzling out and it just you know what I mean? Because you can really, uh, we really love that the the level of responsibility is equal. So it's like we we have to get things done. It doesn't it doesn't matter, and we both have to have those those characteristic traits about us that we cannot leave here until things are done. We can't leave customers hanging. We can't leave our team hanging. We we can't do any of that. It's it's both of us. We're in this together, and. Uh, you know, other team members don't have that the same responsibility as we do. I mean, they're all very responsible and they do and they do quite a bit, but it's definitely nothing like like an owner and us being partners. It's nice to know that um, if, you know, he goes on vacation or he's doing something, I know what needs to be done and vice versa. It works out the same way. So really to like that responsibility level. But I think if I were to if I were to choose a partner, I would definitely go back and say, hey, um, look at the people that have been in your life for many years. And, uh, if there's anything that you see in them that would make for a good partner, you know, how did they, you know, what kind of projects have they worked on? What kind of, how long have they been at their job? You know, have you seen them handle, how did you see them handle that, uh, divorce or that thing that happened with their kid or whatever? You can really tell a lot about people when they handle themselves in uh, certain life situations. And there's been a lot of people in my life where I saw them handle really difficult situations. And I've, I was really proud of them. I was like, wow, like I was really surprised that one could handle that situation as well as you have. Yeah. So, um, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give to, uh, somebody on the fence about, um, you know, kind of acquiring a partner? I, I think I would just echo actually a lot of the things you just said, you know, like really, um, really sort of, you know, pay attention to, um, <clears throat> you know, like, like, their background, you know, like what, what have they, uh, and it can be tough cause you don't necessarily have that visibility. Like I think, you know, how have you handled really difficult life situations is probably just a really revealing, um, thing of somebody's character, but unless you're close with somebody or you have, um, you know, you know, a certain sort of level of visibility, you're probably not going to be able to get that, um, level of insight. Um, so it's, it's tough, but I, I think that that's, that's probably, that's probably the the best advice is to just make sure you do your homework and and uh, get to know somebody. But but maybe also um, I, I would say, and this is probably based on 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 my experience, um, which is fine because that's this is my answer to the question. Um, I I uh, with Forrest, we we didn't know each other well um, before we started the the company, um, and I think that sort of just gave us a each like a clean slate basically. And, um, you know, I, I was, and I know he was as well, um, just really open to, uh, you know, building the relationship and open to, 
um, adjusting, you know, maybe some of our own sort of styles of communication and the way that we worked. Um, we were just, you know, you mentioned communication earlier. I think that's um, incredibly important. Like you just need to be open and communicative um, and you need to be okay with being wrong. You know, like I think that uh, um, it's important to have healthy, productive debate and conflict and you need to like have that in a business in order to arrive at, at good decisions and the best path forward. Um, but it's, but you need to be able to, to have that based on a foundation of, of, of trust and, and, you know, not get hung up on, Oh, like, you know, we're, we're making a decision that is counter to, you know, my opinion this time, or maybe I was actually wrong about sort of how I thought about a certain, certain thing. And, and I should actually just adjust my framework a little bit to think about this differently. Um, I think just being open to that, um, especially sort of in the, in the early days of, of building a new relationship with somebody, getting to know them and, and sort of each of you just sort of, you know, coming to develop and understand your, your place in the thing, you know, because whatever your idea of it is at the beginning is, is almost certainly not going to be what the thing is, right? Like you're probably not, you probably don't have a perfectly designed mental model of the thing. It's going to be, you know, you're going to, you're going to duck and dodge and weave sort of your way to, uh, the, the optimal sort of, you know, scenario. And actually that's probably, more of a journey than an end state. Like you're constantly needing to, to dodge and weave. Um, and, and that dodging and weaving isn't probably following the mental map that you set out at the outset. Like it's going to be something different than, than what you planned. And you just need to be open to that. Yeah, that's Definitely. all. That's awesome. really good advice for sure. Hey, um, so we kind of talked about, you know, when you guys moved into your building, you were at like 23, 24, um, people and you're much larger now. Can you kind of talk about how large job jobber is now and how you, kind of the differences between when you were a smaller company to larger company, how you handle that organization and those issues that come up, you know, how you have interruptions in your software, interruptions in your day to day, like how that's changed. Yeah, sure. So I think that we, so we're jobber is about 110 people today. Um, we're hiring people almost every week. So we're growing very quickly, you know, and it's funny, we, we just yesterday um, had a, uh, I, I do a welcome meeting um, for, for new employees of, of the company, new, new team members. Uh, we do it in cohorts now because the company grows um, pretty quickly. And so rather than meeting with every individual, it's, it's usually in groups of, you know, five or 10. And um, <clears throat> one of the topics that I, that I touch on in that meeting um, is specifically the responsibility that we have to our, to our, our customers and, and, the, and the businesses um, who are using Jobber. And it's not just the, that these businesses are, are using Jobber, they're running their businesses using Jobber. They're relying on us um, to, to, to get the right people to the right place to do the right job for their customers and, and to, to invoice them and collect money so that they can pay their employees. Like that all falls apart if we're not doing our job properly um, and, and delivering a, a reliable, consistent service to our, to our customers. And it's a huge responsibility. And I usually, you know, I, I talk about that in the context of how many you know, businesses are using Jobber, and I can't share that information publicly, but um, it's a significant number of, of businesses at this point growing very quickly. Um, what I, one of the numbers I can share is, um, you know, at sort of on a run rate basis, our customers deliver um, just about $3 billion a year worth of, worth of services to their customers. It's a tremendous amount of, of economic activity uh, that is 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 being powered in part by by Jobber, and so you know we have a, a a massive responsibility to take that really seriously and do everything that that we can as a as a business uh, to to you know do right by that by that responsibility and the commitment we made to our customers. So um, you know uptime and and just the reliability of the the software and the overall quality of what we're what we're building um, is a is a huge theme. It's a it's a big big part of. Um, you know, the, the conversations that happen within the product organization. So the company today is um, about 110 people or so. Um, roughly half of the business is um, specifically sort of building building product. And the product organization is quite sophisticated. So, you know, it's not just a bunch of engineers and software developers. It's, you know, technical designers and project managers and product managers and, um, you know, people who are who are taking all of the, the various, you know, signals 
um, that we get from from customers and from market to make sure that we're building the right stuff. But also people who are are specifically in charge of making sure that you know our databases are are running really smoothly and and that we have um, lots of of sort of capacity and headroom to be able to handle spikes in usage. Um, you know we can see you know, on a daily basis, you know, like seven, seven, seven or 8 a.m. Eastern rolls around and all of a sudden the servers are going crazy because <laughs> everyone's, everyone's logging in and seeing what they've got to do for the day. We've got to make sure that, you know, we're anticipating that and we're able to, to, to deal with it. So, you know, over the, the last three or four years in particular, we've really sort of uh, evolved and matured as an organization from, um, you know, a company that just is like building product all the time to a company that's um, you know, building product all the time, but also really takes seriously the maintenance and support of of the infrastructure that we that that we currently have that our customers rely on uh, to deliver their own services day to day. So, I would I would say that it's early days still. Um, we are uh, just a, a seed of, of of what we can be in the future, but obviously we are a much more um, developed organism today than we were a few years ago when we first moved into this this building and and you know a year or so prior to that closer to when we actually you know kind of hired our first people um you know i, I remember so we, we have an office in in toronto now that we're that we're growing and that um <clears throat> that introduces another layer of complexity where you've got multiple locations and you need to manage communication but it's really interesting because it reminds me of the early days um, when we were in our small office, because there's only about 10 people in, in Toronto right now, and that office will grow quickly, but it, everyone's just in sort of one fairly contained space, and you can you can overhear everything that's going on, and there's different there's different people um, in different sort of departments uh, of the company. It's not like all one. It's not like an office to just do one thing. It's it's an office where we have people performing different uh, kinds of functions. There's lots of travel all the time between the Toronto and Edmonton office, and that's part of sort of maintaining communication and and uh, making sure that people are able to to build and maintain relationships. But I think it, it highlights for me because I spend a lot of time in the Toronto office. It highlights for me just how far we've come and how much things have changed from that 10 people in an office, you know, when the whole company was 10 people to today. And so communication is the biggest challenge by far, um, just making sure that we're striking the right balance of um, communicating the right amount of the right information to the right people at the right time. Because in the, in the olden days with 10 people, you're, all of the information is communicated to all of the people all of the time because you're just all in one place. And so there's this sort of osmosis effect where everybody just kind of, by virtue of the fact that they're they're coming to work every day, is sort of in the loop and up to speed on everything that's going on. Um, and that's true of, of sort of like the practical um, you know, here are the projects we're working on and here's sort of, you know, where the, those projects are at. But it, it, so it's true of that, but it's also true of the more um, sort of um, intangible elements of a business, which are much more foundational and much more important. So the culture of the, of the, of the business, like why do we exist as a, as a company? Why do we exist as a business? And, and how, do we, how do we behave? How do we treat one another? That stuff is all just sort of communicated very sort of um, subconsciously almost in a in a small group setting like that versus today where, um, you know, you might, you know, for new people that are that are hired, it's going to take you, you know, two or three months to learn everybody's names, um, you know, maybe a month or so to actually make your way through the entire office and meet everybody. But then we've got people in Toronto that maybe you don't meet um, for a much, much longer period of time until there's some travel that allows that sort of situation. But it's still critically important um, and probably most important that all of those people, new people um, and, and old alike, uh, continue to sort of share one common sort of fabric for those foundational, intangible um, elements like like the culture of the organization. Why do we exist? 
as a, as a business, how do we, how do we behave? How do we treat one another? And how, how are we going to win? Like, how are we going to actually do the stuff that we need to do in order to deliver maximum value to our customers and, and ultimately be successful as a, as a business through our customers success? Yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, I, for our listeners, I think the way you, we can relate with that is, and I know Greg and I talk about this a lot is when you know we're, we're never we're probably not going to have a company of a hundred people or I don't know any pool service company that has that large of one. But I think what we can relate with that is you know as we've grown from us to to three to four people where you know it was us two and those two in a room and we could say hey this customer is going through this we need to make sure this happens this and this and that you know everybody kind of understands where you're at in one little group right and you you know everything about every customer together as one little group it moves but as we get bigger and now we have a service manager we have an office you know, admin um we're not on every phone call and we're not in every you know, conversation anymore. And I think that's where it kind of relate to some of our listeners on that kind of scale is where, you know, it's, it's very difficult to make sure that the customers understand that. And then also that our team understands what our vision is and what we believe and, you know, where we came from. We had, we actually had our team listen to episode one when we came out with it, because there's a few people that hadn't, hadn't been there from the beginning with us and like, Hey, you know, like this is, this is how we started brothers. This is what we believe in. This is the background. Um, this is what we provide and we want you guys to be a part of that, understand that culture. So I think, you know, it's very important within, you know, for our listeners that, 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 that business and that you keep relaying that message and that to your team and that, that, that message still goes through your team. And we don't know if it was, uh, real transparent, but we wanted them to know how truly hard it was when we first started this, because it was a huge risk and we both had pretty decent jobs before we got into this. And, um, it was a ton of hard work because you had to learn something new. You, we've never owned or ran businesses before. So you had, uh, you had to learn the finance side, the marketing side. There's so many different elements and dealing with customers, each customer, each new client has a different personality. And, you know, in a perfect world, you would think that, oh, we're just providing a service. They're going to act one way. They're just going to pay at the beginning of the month. That's just how it is. But each one is very unique and it takes a long time. And there's probably processes that people don't truly understand, but it's like, dude, this is in place because we've gotten burned so many times and uh, a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into getting, you know, brothers started and it was really important for our team to listen to that so that they can have, you know, the slightest bit understanding of what what went into that. I know? think it's an important for that on that topic for our team, for us to be on the same level of respect if, um, and for them to view us that way, because, you know, now we sit in offices quite a bit. And we understand, you know, in Arizona, it's 110 outside. We've been through that hustle. We've been through that grind. We've we've spent years cleaning pools and understanding the industry. We did repairs. We've we've gone through all of that. Um, but the newest people coming in haven't seen that. So, you know, if, for us to show, to explain to them, like, hey, you know, like, we totally get what you're going through. And, you know, on previous podcasts, we talk about how we, we understand, we take on customers now based on the knowledge we have that we've been through. We don't, we don't take on pools that we wouldn't want to service. We don't deal with customers that we wouldn't want to deal with ourselves. We still hold true to that, to our team. And, you know, that's, I think that level of respect, that's how we kind of even that out. Like, Hey, you know, like, cause I think some people look at that and be like, Hey, you're the one that's sitting in a nice office in the air conditioning, but you know, they miss if they, if they're just new to the team, they, they've missed all that, you know, yeah. all that grind and all that hard work that it took to get to this point. Yeah. On top of running the business, I mean, there was a time, I mean, the average amount of pools our team cleans is probably about, I don't know, 12 to 15 pools a day. And when we were doing it, it was about 30 pools a day <laughs> plus emails while cleaning pools, after pools, uh, you know, calls and, you know, all the things that go with running a business while actually doing the work. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. So, um, there was we two, definitely two plus understand. years where we worked, I mean, 5 a.m. to 8, 9 p.m. I mean, seven days a week almost. Maybe we had half of Sunday off, but yeah, you know, that's, can, that's why, that's why I love you guys. That's, that's, the, <laughs> that's that attitude that is just so like great with small business people. You do what it takes. You know, you took the risk. Um, it's a brave like thing to do in the first place. And yeah, those early years are, can be shit like you but you gotta 
you just got to get through it. You got to put one foot in front of the other and just like grind away. Um, and ultimately like you get to, to, to where you guys are now and it's, it's a, it's a great story. Yeah. But it was a, it was a fun ride. You know what I mean? We try to, we always talk about like, enjoy the ride and the experience. We only have one life and this is part of the journey. Don't want to, you know, stress out too much and get to success. And then you're like, man, I don't really remember. I don't really remember what happened. You know what I mean? I was kind of pissed off the whole time, but we've really truly enjoyed, you know, the process and every, you know, kind of milestone we got to, we kind of reflect on it. We're like, man, like, like we did it. You know what I mean? And, uh, it's just really cool to always kind of reflect on the little things and not compare yourself. Cause we don't, I don't remember us really doing that too much. We didn't really compare ourselves to other people. We just always did the best that we possibly could with what we had. And we just kind of, I don't know. We just kind of kept moving along. And yeah. I think a lot of people are always like, ah, oh, I really wish that I was this company or this and that. And it's like, don't worry about that. You don't have any idea the stresses that they have and the things that they're dealing with. Just do you and create what, what you want and be happy. You know what I'm I mean? S- yeah. Yeah. And you're still on the journey, right? Like it's, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not over. You're still obviously like the the business is growing. You've got the pool chasers project. Like I think it's uh, I think it's awesome what you guys are doing. Oh, it's so much fun, and yeah. we probably get you know I don't want to say crap. Our our wives are awesome, but every time we take on some new idea or project, it's like <laughs> man, like you just you can't stop, huh? It's like dude, we we love it. I don't I don't know if we would know what to do with ourselves if we weren't yeah. just uh, you know running around like crazy all the time. So you want to talk to us a little bit about the culture at Jobber? I mean, I know you have a beautiful facility and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's funny. We um, we, we do have a, a, a beautiful office. We're quite proud of it. Um, it's a really nice place uh, to to you know do our work, um, and and it's got a lot of you know like. I, I hesitate to to admit it because it's almost too you know startup cliche. Um, I also don't want anybody listening to get the idea that people here aren't working their asses off every day, but we've got, you know, ping pong and food. Well, we know they are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but there's, yeah, there's lots of perks, right? Like we, we do um, a lot of that stuff. We, you know, have a a fully stocked kitchen uh, for the team and all of that stuff is, um, is, is sort of, you know, contributes to the, the environment is, is important. And the kitchen in particular is a really interesting collision space to just try and make sure that people have opportunity to, um, to, to spend time with one another, especially like cross departmentally to getting like, you know, people from the finance or the marketing team, um, spending time with people from sales or from, from customer success. Um, but none of that is, is our culture. Like none of this, like the brick wall and the nice, you know, space and the, the food in the kitchen and the you know, ping pong and, and beer and stuff like that. Um, none of that is, 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 is actually foundational to the culture. The culture is like, it, it could all, I a hundred percent believe this, all of that stuff could get, could get torn out of the office tomorrow and, and it would have zero impact on, on the, the company it would have zero impact on the desire for everybody in this office to, to, to come to work the next day and keep doing what we're doing um, to deliver value to our customers. Our culture is, is based entirely around why we exist as a business, which is, which is to make you more successful. It's to, to make small business people, uh, the people in small businesses, more successful. And everybody rallies around that ultimate goal. Everything that we do ladders up to that, uh, to, to that ultimate mission. Um, and then also just the the shared sort of characteristics, how we treat one another as a as a group, because as you get bigger and bigger, making sure that that everybody can really kind of focus and align themselves and for sort of face in the direction of that shared mission and that shared vision um, is is tricky. It can be really really difficult, and so you have to understand what the shared characteristics. Um, of a of a group of people need to be in order to coordinate the efforts of a hundred or two hundred or five hundred people um, or more to collectively um, you know pr- produce the you know the results that we need to produce to to deliver value to you ultimately. So, yeah, um, so maybe we're talking about two different things a little bit: your culture and then maybe the work environment is you know that way because that way your employees are enjoying and being happy as well as you know yeah. showing that culture to you know the world. And I think it can be, there's a virtuous cycle there. Like I think the, 
Um, I think the work environment is a product of our culture. Um, we're able to have a really great work environment um, because the culture is very strong. And the work environment is a tool to help further nurture and develop and evolve the, the culture. So sure. as, you know, to my point about the kitchen, I think like, yeah, it's, it's awesome that we can, that we can as a company um, provide that benefit to, to our people. Um, but it's there so that our people can spend more time with one another mm -hmm. and sort of get to know each other and talk about our customers in our kitchen. Uh, we have um, customer profiles. So we've got all of these um, sort of headshots of some of our earliest customers and and, uh, and and people actually we should probably get get, get you guys up in there um, and just information about their business you know like when did they start what are, what kind of service are they providing like why did they start what keeps them going like what's you know the 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 you know trying to just make sure that everybody stays connected to the reason that we exist um, is is really important and providing a platform and an environment where where it's hard to like not do that. You almost do it every day by accident is, is part of how um, we're able to continue to develop a really strong culture. What do you think uh, motivates them on a day to day? I mean, if it's not maybe the kitchen and the ping pong and stuff, because I could imagine working in a place like that, because I'm not really into a lot of that stuff that I would more just respect that. I know that that's a big investment from, you know, the owner or the CEO, I would really just respect that. And I would just kind of move on and do what I need to do. Yeah. But what do you think is the big, I mean, do you have these, uh, powwow meetings in the morning, um, that really gets the team, you know, fired up and ready? I mean, what, what is it that you do that really, and I ask this because I mean, you guys, everybody we talk to everyone from Molly, that's been, you know, amazing since day one. Um, and the whole, um, you know, service team has just been, just been on point and we love it. So we're just curious, like, what is that secret sauce? Yeah. Um, so I think, and I mean, you know, hopefully our competitors aren't listening to this cause I don't want to give away our secret sauce, but, um, <laughs> it's, it's the, so we have a concept, um, internally that we talk about called voice of customer. Um, and we, we provide, um, a lot of different venues and facilities for, um, the voice of our customer to be shared throughout the organization. So, um, you know, I think that those, you know, the example that I that I mentioned earlier about sort of you know customer stories in the kitchen is one example of that. But there are other sort of real time drink from the fire hose examples. And and so we we use an internal communication tool called Slack. Um, it's just a chat um, you know application. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it might be an interesting way for, for you guys to sort of, uh, you know, keep the team connected. It's a great mobile app, mm -hmm. um, really common amongst, amongst startups to, to use, but we have a channel, um, specifically for, um, voice of customer and every single piece of, um, feedback or information that we, that we get from our, our customers, um, comes in through there. So it can be, um, you know, a quick conversation, uh, that somebody on the service team has had with a, a somebody on the phone. It can be a review that we got online somewhere. It can be an NPS, uh, feedback and net promoter score, like automatic, uh, sort of feedback, um, rating that came in through the app. Um, it can be cancellations, people who are, are saying that they want to cancel their, their account. All of that flows in through that customer. It's mandatory that everybody in the company is part of that part of that channel, um, and it's not for discussion. It's just for for free feedback from customers, and so it's a it provides a a, a pulse for the 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 sentiment of the the of you of the people who are using our product every day um, and and achieving success with it or getting frustrated with it and, and feeling shitty about it. So. Like it's it's important to to have the good with the bad, um, and and it's all celebrated. Like everybody in that um, in that channel gets to participate in the success of our customers. So because we get a lot of amazing feedback, like we get far more um, really positive, heartfelt uh, feedback from from our customers who tell us stories about like the difference that the product has made not just in their business, but in their, in their life. And it's, it's crazy that we get to be uh, a part of that. And that's really celebrated internally. I think to answer your question, um, that is what motivates people 
um, to, to be here every day. Yeah, it's, it's not ping pong or foosball or food in the kitchen or whatever. It's, it's, it's the fact that we get to really make a difference in the, in the lives of our, of our customers and that they share that with us, that they, they actually like proactively, voluntarily um, give us access to this information um, and the bad stuff too. So, and that's, that's really important, right? Like when we, when we hear that we've let somebody down um, for one reason or another, it's important for us to, to hear that uh, and to acknowledge it and then to, to, to mobilize internally to figure out like what, what happened, what went wrong, uh, how do we prevent it from happening in the future? People take it really seriously internally. It's just like that, that voice of customer um, is, is taken really seriously. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the questions we had for you was, you know, how much you guys depend on, you know, the user feedback. It sounds like it's pretty important to everything you guys do, not only with your culture, but how do you kind of depend on that, I guess, for the software itself as well? Yeah. Every, I mean, same, same thing. Voice of customer is, um, sort of, you know, one of the primary, uh, sort of, you know, forms of, of, of input into, uh, product development efforts. So every single thing that a customer um, or a user of our product uh, submits through any kind of channel um, goes into a goes into a system to to catalog, um, and and we intersect that with and combine that with um, other work that we do and research uh, that we do um, in the market more more broadly to understand what a, you know what's the stuff we should be working on um, because we can't work on everything and we can't build everything. Um, but we do want to make sure that the, the signals that are most important and the, are, are not most important, but the signals that are uh, presenting sort of, you know, m most heavily uh, are the ones that we're able to see um, and, and that we have a system in place to be able to see that. So, um, you know, there's, there's a pretty, pretty sophisticated sort of, you know, system of tools that we use internally to, to, to really understand, you know, what, what, what are people asking for? What are people asking for the most? Why are they asking for that? How does that intersect with what people in the market are more broadly asking for? And then it's our job as a, as a product company, as a software company to synthesize all of that into something that is, um, that has a user experience that people can actually deal with because what we don't want to do is build Salesforce. Uh, for home services, right? Because nobody's going to use that. You need, you need training. You need like it's just it's too heavy. It's too difficult. Um, the user experience uh, and the and the ease of use is a really important sort of balancing uh, or counterbalancing element to just you know build every feature that ever gets asked for. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's a. Uh you know, good that you guys depend so much on that feedback and you, know, you guys are always open-minded and we truly, you know, appreciate that, you know, and as we met Greg mentioned earlier, you know, we've worked with Molly and some of the other marketing team. You guys recently kind of hired Nick, right? Your marketing director. And has that been kind of a, a push for you guys? And yeah, he's been with the company. I think Nick was probably our, I should really know this off the, off the top. Sorry, Nick. Uh, <laughs> I think our 12th or, or 13th employee, something along. Oh, okay. like lines. Oh, wow. uh, so yeah, he's, he's seen us through, um, a, a lot of the growth that, that we've experienced and, uh, um, but yeah, it was our, our first, um, sort of, you know, f our first sort of formalizing of the marketing team. Yeah. The reason I bring him up, cause I read an article that him and I think Molly maybe wrote it, but, um, was him talking about how empathy was like one of the most important key things that he likes to hire you talk about the empathy because i think you know mm -hmm. I, I was talking to greg this morning a little bit about that i think that's probably why your team is so great to talk to is because you guys feel some of the issues we're going through and understand that when it things, empathize with us for sure you empathize with us and the things that we go through that affect us and you know how it hurts us deeply sometimes you know as small businesses when you have a software or you have an issue with something that doesn't work for you and it's it's it shows you you know as a it, sh it comes up bad to the customer or our customer because we couldn't provide something because something we used didn't work or something like that. Um, you know, so can you talk about the empathy and that maybe how Nick kind of applies that to your team and, and how that goes forward through Jobber? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that actually dovetails really well into the conversation that we've been having about voice of customer because voice of customer is sort of, um, you know, the pl like a really gr important platform internally for building customer empathy. 
um, the the ultimate goal of um, you know of, of of surfacing all of that feedback and making sure that people see not just the good but the bad also um, is that we, when you feel pain, we should feel pain. And building that customer empathy is going to enable us to um, to, to build a better product, um, but also to 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 position it better, right? To to sort of um, figure out sort of you know in the context of marketing and the work that Nick does, how to how to how to relate in market to the people who who we can help and who should be using Job, um, who aren't, you know, um, it's crazy. Some people aren't using Job. <laughs> um, but that yeah i mean that customer empathy is just it's a it's a really sort of important um you know part of 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 how we um you know build our positioning and build our uh our, the, the way that we that we talk to to the market the way we talk to potential customers um but it but it, it, it goes way deeper than that in the organization it, it, it goes right to the core of um of why we exist uh, as a business and and um uh, and to how we build our product and, and what we build and how we service our customers and uh, that, that customer empathy is is really core. We hire for it as well. I mean, we try to um, as as much as possible, um, you know, build our recruiting process around. Obviously, there's there's you know skills based components to our interviewing processes, but um, there's also a lot of sort of discussion and conversation um, in the process around small business and and sort of testing for. Um, you know, passion around that. And I mean, don't get me wrong, like we're not, I don't expect every person that we hire to be as passionate about small business as, as I am and, and to feel the same way. But I think you have to have a seed and, um, and, and we as a company can develop that in people over time. Yeah, I think a good takeaway for our listeners and what we do at Brothers, I think, you know, we use that same type of empathy towards our customers. And when we have a situation where a customer isn't happy or, or even the good feedback as well. We, we definitely relay that to our team. But I think it's more importantly, the, the customers that aren't happy, you know, we try to emphasize with them and understand a little bit like where they're coming from because they may have had, you know, a dad or a parent die or a dog die or something recently where they latched, they lashed out in a way that they really don't kind of feel fully. But, you know, we just yeah. were the ones that got stepped on because of some other issue. And, you know, Greg and I have taken that approach quite a bit the last, over the last year or so with like, you know, we need to, somebody's probably going through something else. Let's figure out the core issue to the problem, how we yeah. can help them. You know, we, we try to do their best, to take care of our customers and we emphasize with them as well. And we also, I think, relay that empathy throughout the team saying, you know, Hey, like when an issue does arise, we all, we try our best not to call those people out in big group meetings either. We'll go to them one-on-one -on -one a little bit and be like, hey, this happened with this, you know, hey, you know. And then later on, we use that example in a meeting where we don't call out the person, but we'll say, hey, you guys just be paying attention, you know, to this because it kind of came up over the last week and want to make sure we're all on the same page. So, you know, let's not do this moving forward or whatever. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's a good takeaway for the listeners is just kind of like figure out a way to relay what your customers are providing to your whole team and, you know, figure out a way to make that experience better all around for them. Yeah. I think it's important um, to understand without understanding because you have to be sincere and it's all about the way your voice sounds. And I think we genuinely get that now. Um, there's a lot of things that I truly don't understand, but the way I talk to people and how sincere and caring that I can be with them, even if I don't truly understand, they, I'm saving myself time. I'm saving myself a lot of time because I'm just trying to figure it out and being like, okay, I, I do apologize. I want you to know that we are here for you and we're going to take care of this. Um, and I think that goes a long way instead of you just being like, you know what, lady, I don't understand what the hell you want us to do. Like, blah, 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 blah. Like all that does is makes things worse. Regardless if that's what you want to do, that to me is a, is a bad business owner because you're not, that is not a good strategy regardless of, you know, what you think you need. This is in some words, it's a uh, kind of a game and that's just kind of how you have to play it sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, I actually had, um, sorry to interrupt you. I, I actually, made that mistake and we lost a customer because of it. So it's definitely, I mean, I, I had tried to help this lady three or four times and my last email to her was basically like, I don't really know what you want me to do. You know, maybe we're not the best fit for you. Probably wasn't written the best way. And I can see that now. Um, so, you know, but, but I understand, like, I mean, 
just jumping to that conclusion, like, I don't know what you want from us. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. Like there's, you know, that, that put a bad taste in her mouth and I get it. And yeah, no, I, I mean, just going to pile on basically. I think the, the, um, you know, fixing a problem or dealing with somebody who is, is sort of taking an antagonistic position because, um, because they don't like something that you did or they weren't happy with the service or whatever. Um, fixing that situation, like doing whatever it takes going above and beyond to, to, to fix that kind of uh, a situation or a scenario um, is always an opportunity to earn an evangelist customer. Um, like I think people are, are really, especially in like this, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it, but in this day and age, mm-hmm. um, you know, service uh, is just oftentimes not the emphasis, right? Speed and price uh, are, are in a lot of cases the, the, the sort of like, you know, number one and number two most important um, sort of elements to, to a product or a service and, and the delivery of that product or service. Um, and, and people are really kind of forgetting about the service, it's just the quality of the service. And, um, and especially in those moments where there's, there's sort of a, a problem or somebody's unhappy, um, that's, the, that's the killer secret weapon, right? Like kill them with kindness. That's, that's, I think, a, a really great way to turn a situation around and not just like save that situation, save that customer, but then have that customer go out and talk about that experience to people and generate referral business for you. Like it's a really kind of pays dividends. I think that's the, one of the best weapons that people don't use because you have to have a ton of self-control to be able to bottle that up because we've been in a lot of situations and I'll be real honest. I used to have a really bad temper when I was younger and I've been faced with some really, uh, unique and crazy situations where I was really, my limits were pushed and I just, I just knew, you know what I mean? That this is for the greater good to just keep yourself under control. There was some years ago, um, there was a gentleman that we put a, a new vacuum in his pool And I mean, he called and I mean, he was cursing and he's like, you're going to come get this damn thing out, blah, 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 blah. And we're just like, okay, sir, like, we don't want any problems. We're going to do as you ask. And I mean, I recorded it on my phone, like the whole conversation, because I knew this guy was going to come out and just be like, just hassling me the whole time. And Tyler got to hear the conversation. I mean, this dude was hovering over me while I'm trying to do my job and giving him his money back. And he's just like, he's like, I don't know what your problem is. You said it was going to do this and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yes, I did, sir. And I do apologize, sir. And it was just, it was just, yes, sir, the whole time. And I could just tell when I left, I'm like, is there anything else you need me to do, sir, before I leave, blah, blah, blah. And I think just that look in his face and eyes was like, like, really? Like, you're not going to give me anything else? You're just going <laughs> to, while I'm sitting here just giving you shit the whole time, you're just going to take it? And I'm like, yeah. yep, yep. And as soon as, I, like 10 minutes after this, I'm done. Like, I won't even think about it. I'm going to move on because every customer like that, there's like another 10 amazing yeah. customers that would never in a million years do something like that. Yeah. And it is, there is, there is a line, you know, like I think it's important to, to know where the line is and, and we, we respect that internally as well. Like we, if our cust if somebody is, is, you know, calls in and is abusive or threatening, um, we will fire a customer. Like we, we will not, we will not service people who, um, who, who threaten or, or abuse uh, people on our team. Everyone gets frustrated. People can call in and they're screaming and yelling about whatever. And, and, and we, like, we will help to get to the bottom of that. And that's, that's all fine. But yeah, if you, you know, if you threaten the physical safety of, of somebody on our team, like you're done. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's a good, like everyone's got to know where that line is. Right. And especially, and that line is going to be different for you than it is for somebody on your team. Like you probably, um, are, are far more well positioned to, to deal, just deal with that guy uh, in that moment. But, you know, when you when you think about what you want to like, how you want to protect your, your team and your people uh, and what what they should be expected to put up with, um, it's kind of not the same as what you should be expected to put up with. Yeah, For definitely. Sure. And I think it's sometimes you have to have the courage to to say it in a kind way, but it's like, Hey, do you want to call me back when you have a little bit more self-control? I don't ever say that, but I've asked people like pretty much like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to listen to what you want, but you know, you're being pretty disrespectful and you're definitely not going to talk to me like that. 
So what do we need to do here so that we can get this figured out? Cause I'm yeah, not. I mean, we fired customers several times um, cause they won't put their dogs away or the dogs have attacked our guys. And we've told them several times. I mean, we've had one person that, that was screaming at one of our guys and telling him he was incompetent and that he knew more than he did and stuff like that. And we're not going to take that. I mean, we're not gonna let them take that. So there's definitely a line. We we're very open with our team. Like, Hey, if something like this happens, like you need to let us know. I mean, and we're, we're very open in general. I mean, if you break something, something happens, like I, we'd much rather know right away that way we can just handle it. You know, I don't care if you broke a $300, you know, glass vase in the backyard, but like, I mean, it's we'll, an accident. It's an accident and we'll cover it and do what we have to do to make, but if we don't tell them that we broke it, that's a whole entire another game, you know, that that's crazy. So we've definitely fired customers as well and we protect our team. So we get that for sure. So Sam, what do you think are some major roadblocks that you faced in the uh, kind of earlier stages of Jobber? Or I mean, I guess where you're at right now, is there any major roadblocks that you kind of ran into that help kind of define, you know, who you guys are now? I honestly, I can't think of any, any major roadblocks, but if I sort of reframe the question um, a little bit, if, if you don't mind. Sure, um, sure. I think that uh, that there are, are there have been certain sort of like pivotal things that we've that we've done or milestones that we've achieved in the business that have really helped to unlock the next sort of you know phase of, of success, which um, or phase of, of growth, which which I think is is you know over, like in a sense overcoming roadblocks that you maybe just don't realize are roadblocks at the time, um, and p- like people is just the biggest thing the 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 sort of biggest um sort of element to our success i think as a as an organization is the people that make up the organization and as we've gotten bigger um it's it's been really um impactful to get people involved who have experience build it not just like doing performing functions like really highly skilled engineers and great marketing people but people who are um, really thoughtful and have experience uh, building great organizations. So, um, you know, we're at a size now where we're where we're thinking about management. And I've made um, I've made some hires for the executive team um, over the last couple of years. Uh, and and those situations where where all of a sudden you're you're sort of you know unlocking. I, I feel like like in a lot of cases those um, kinds of hires and those kinds of people really help unlock hidden potential in the in the organization that just allows us to 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 move um faster and and more deliberately um than uh than than we have in the past i know we'll have more of those many more of those situations in the future but we're also now um you know really just really thinking about how we're going to grow sort of management within the company right it's not a like we're i've got no interest in building a, a highly sort of bureaucratic environment, um, but I don't. I think that's a really cynical way to look at management. Management isn't about putting roadblocks in place and, and creating friction. It's about enabling people uh, to to do better and to unlock the potential that exists. And so I think we've just been really fortunate to um, to to have some of those people come into the business. And also have some of those people in the business already, and 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 you know I'm really excited about um, the potential for us to grow people within the organization. There's so much potential, uh, and and so many folks in the company who um, just like are really passionate about what we're doing. Um, they have a lot of uh, you know skill and and sort of practical uh, expertise to offer. Uh, to, to, to what we're doing on a day-to-day basis, but they also have um, a lot of, of potential and ability to help us unlock um, a lot of that hidden potential within the, the rest of the, the, the organization as we, as we continue to grow. So nice. I think that like overcome, yeah, I mean, for, for us anyways, like, and, and I think companies that, that end up being large groups of people, just the people are so important and the yeah. people can really help I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but the people that can help the people really do the most that they can are, it's just a, it's just a really important part of organization building. And, um, and that's, that's, I think helped us overcome, 
um, what in retrospect I would consider to be roadblocks in, in the past. I think, you know, in studying, we, we do kind of a lot of research on the people when we're going to interview them. And I think one of the things we found on you, I guess, was you talked about in another interview in the beginning where you went out the first time to try and get money to grow the business and it came, you know, you kind of ended up empty handed there. Was that kind of a little bit of a roadblock at that point trying to do yeah, that? For sure. And actually, so the re- so we went out to raise uh, a series a, uh, back in, in, t- I think 2014 and, um, we, yeah, I, I came, I was on the road for, for quite a while um, you know, like talking to investors and trying to raise that, that round. Um, it was less about, um, the, the reticence for people to move from pen and paper to technology because we, we'd actually been, um, growing quite nicely as a business. It was more that nobody had any idea where the hell Edmonton was. So (laughs) there's this startup based in, in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and I'm, you know, talking to investors in, you know, Silicon Valley and Boston and New York and, um, it's just it's a it's a big risk, right? Like small company, um, not in their backyard. Um, I think that that sort of mentality around investing has changed a lot in the last few years, and a lot of investors are um, much more open to 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 investing into into businesses that are that are not in in the big sort of tech hubs. Uh, sure. And actually, like a lot of investors are specifically looking to invest not in the big tech hubs because it's so expensive and competitive saturated right now yeah so outside of jobber is there anything that you do um any extra activities that you do for fun to clear your head is there any books you read or do you go to the water park we just saw you guys have a crazy like uh water park inside the mall or something crazy it looks amazing i'm like yeah we need one of those i think uh that's at west edmonton mall which i think is still the biggest mall in the world maybe not but um yeah there's a water park in there a whole bunch of stuff i don't go there locals uh, (laughs) locals don't go to the the mall it's worst attraction mostly um yeah to be honest like i i think you know i know that this is not um healthy (laughs) but um i don't really do a lot other than than focus on on the business and uh, and my own sort of personal learning uh, around the business and, and what I need to do and how I need to develop as CEO because my job changes over time, right? It's not the same. It's not the same job, um, and to to a, to a degree, it can feel like you're like you're always sort of um, you know playing playing catch up a little bit or, or always. Um, you know, developing for the next phase of the business, which which I love. Like I, I just I think that's really uh, an awesome part of doing what I do is is just how much how much I need to learn and how much I need to develop uh, <clears throat> as a, as a as an individual in order to in order to be effective in my in my role and do what I need to do in order for the company to be successful. So so I spend a lot of time. Um, on those kinds of activities. I mean, I, I work a lot, which is not surprising, and I travel a lot for work, uh, which takes up a lot of time. I'm really fortunate to have um, uh, like a really awesome group of, of friends and family, uh, and I get to spend time with them. And that's that's sort of like my my sort of decompressed time. I, and I make sure that I get enough of that on a uh, on a week to week basis. That that I'm not just you know like 18 hour days every every day. Um, try to exercise a little bit, not anywhere near enough. Uh, I like to cook. Um, but in terms of, you know, actual hobbies, uh, there's, there's, there's not a whole lot anymore. And I'll, I'm almost all, I can't remember the last time I read a real book, which is <laughs> <laughs> since lots, college. Of business books, lots of blogs, lots of, um, you know, com- like you know, stuff related to, to, to startups and, and doing what we do. Um, but, uh, since but you I, travel a lot, I mean, what do you do on the airplanes? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you, if you don't read like actual books, you do audio books. What do you kind of do with well, the time? The most of my flight routes are fully connected now. They've got Wi-Fi, so um, <laughs> it's, I'm just I'm doing back what to work. I normally, would be doing yeah, <laughs> yeah, research. Uh, you know, writing emails. Um, you know, working on strategy. There's, um, there's, there's, there's not a lot. It's yeah. I mean, that's changed a lot. Just even in the the time that that we've been doing this, the airplane has gone from uh, this like safe place to just be disconnected and unavailable and like read a book or listen to a podcast to a fully connected <laughs> place right. where anybody can get a hold of you. So, um, but I do, uh, there, there's a handful of podcasts that I listen to. Um, 
and uh, but they're all they're all focused around uh, building startups and stuff as well. There's the the Saster podcast, and and Reed Hoffman has a really good podcast. And um, I'm gonna listen to to I, I haven't listened to the first one. It sounds like the first of your guys' podcast is the origin story, which I'm mm-hmm. really curious about. Yeah, so, check that uh, one out. I'm gonna check that one out this weekend. Is there any advice you would give then? I mean, to entrepreneurs or people doing startup businesses? I mean, not necessarily maybe the tech side, but in relation to what we do as a small business, is there anything you've heard or seen from your customers that you would kind of give advice on? Yeah. I mean, I think some of it was, was, has been surfaced in our conversation so far. I think like just keep getting one foot in front of the other, right? Like you guys have lived it, you've been through it. Like, you know, how hard, like you've made reference to that, you know, first couple of years, um, and it's fun and energizing, but it can be really hard. And I think just just really um, remembering that, that like all you need to do is just make sure that you're getting one foot in front of the other uh, over and over and over again until you you sort of like hit the next milestone and then the next milestone and um, and and just keep building. I think is is one of the most important um, you know things to to be thinking about. And then you know value your time appropriately um like you are your time is is not free i think like at your peril um you assign a zero dollar price tag to, to to each hour of your of your time um and and i think it's all like regardless of the kind of business regardless of you know whether you're a venture-backed startup or a or a pool company or a maid service or a landscaping business like focus on the customer like number one is is just like really care about the, the experience uh, and the service that you're delivering and the value that you're delivering to your customer. I know from the couple of podcasts that I've listened uh, to from, from you guys, that's a theme that, that comes up uh, repeatedly is just like the value that you're delivering. Um, just r- really make sure that you're delivering that value and, and doing everything that you can to, uh, to wow and impress and, and deliver a, a, a great experience to your customer and everything else um, will probably fall in, in line behind that. So we're wrapping up the episode here. Do you want to plug Jobber a little bit where everybody can find you guys? Yeah. Um, you know, come come check us out at, uh, at getjobber.com, G-E-T-J-O-B-B-E-R.com, or just uh, Google search Jobber. Uh, we've got lots of cool resources available on the site through our, uh, our academy platform. Um, but, uh, you know, it's free to sign up for the, uh, for, for the trial. We offer a 14 day free trial. Uh, we've got a whole team. They're actually just outside the meeting room or a lot of them, some of them in Toronto, but, um, right outside where I am here talking to customers, uh, just like you all over the world. Uh, we're here to help. We want to, uh, we want to help make you, uh, more successful, uh, in your, in your businesses and, uh, yeah, just come, come, come check us out. Uh, thanks so much for, for having me and, and, you know, huge, uh, congratulations to to you two and the success you've had in your in your business and now with the Pool Chasers uh, podcast. I, I I love it. I think this is great. Well, Thanks, really Sam. appreciate that, Sam. And it's been a pleasure talking with you. Appreciate your time. A- anytime, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Once again, thank you for your time. If you could please subscribe to the podcast. That's how you get the new updates. And if you feel like you get value from this podcast, please rate it and review it. We would truly appreciate it. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at poolchasers.info at gmail.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our tag is Pool Chasers. Thank you again for listening. What's going on, everybody? This episode is brought to you by Jobber. Jobber is by far our favorite tool for collecting deposits, payments, scheduling customer jobs, and assigning tasks to a specific person on our team. If you're looking for a better way to stay organized, this is it. I don't even know how we did things before Jobber. If you have any questions, their customer service team is out of this world. Jobber is so cool that they are hooking up all of our listeners with a free 14-day trial. Just visit getjobber.com backslash pool chasers. That's getjobber.com backslash pool chasers. Try it out. We promise you won't be disappointed. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.